What's up everybody, NEXT here, coming to you live. And I may be mispronouncing this, but I think it's the Seep or Seep, Saeep, Seep. I wanna say Seep Mound and Earthworks here in Ohio. Just arrived in Ohio, just beginning my adventure here, studying the Hopewell, the Adena before them, and the Archaic predecessors even before them. So. Just arrived here, gonna spend some time just starting to immerse myself now in the culture. You can see, I believe this is the second largest mound and it's the either Seep or Saip. Again, I may be mispronouncing this. Um, still have to figure out the proper pronunciation, but it's the S-I-E-P mound and Earthworks. Though the mound is massive in itself, the mound actually dwarfs the Earthworks that are here on site. Let me turn the camera around so you guys can see what I'm seeing. Okay, so from the mound, about a thousand feet that way. And actually, just for context, so you know, I'm currently standing, as we, as we come closer over there, I'll, I'll be standing in the center of an irregular circle. So hard to make out from the ground here. You can see it's just green all around me. By the way, these subtle plots here, you can see there's a clear distinction of unmanicured grass. Hey, what's up, Shermanator Osborne? Shout out to everyone in the super chat right now. But you can see there's this unmanicured grass here. There's another subtle plot right here. These are excavations that took place. So really for me what this is, and here's another one here. There's actually four in the area. Uh, nay folk, what's up? And so what this is, is a true testament to what's going on here. You see, because we really, when examining the cultures of ancient America, we really don't want to make the mistake that others have made in the past with, say, for example, the ancient Egyptians, where they've attributed the civilization or the culture to being obsessed with death in the afterlife, as prominent as it was, and there, there was more to the culture. And the same here. And so when we look at these subtle plots, this is actually, the archaeologists have found items here that are essentially a testament to you know, not necessarily a culture that was obsessed with death, but a once very vibrant, thriving culture. Um, and so you can actually see here all the postmarks, which would suggest that the, the pole marks were actually here. These would have been wooden beams, and this would have been like a home or perhaps a shop for the ancient artisans that occupied the area here. You can see there's a official signage here about the ancient artists. And here is some of the artifacts that have been unearthed. Absolutely amazing. You know, the, the Hopewell culture, um, just learning myself, but you know, here in Ohio, essentially what we're looking at is we have this extensive, uh, let me turn the camera around as we make our way to the mound. We have extensive earthworks and these enclosure walls, which are all part of the Hopewell's legacy. This was the Hopewell that was here. The Adena before them, the Adena go further back. And then depending who you talk to, there's a few, you know, a few different ideas about, there's obviously the standard academic chronology, but then some will make a case for how far back the uh, Adena should go. But there is an archaic predecessor before them. So it's like the case with Serpent Mound, you know, the, want to attribute it to different cultures but it could go even further back burials in the area suggest that it could go further back whatever the case clearly this is the work of adepts and so let me turn this around it's almost humbling the camera doesn't quite do it justice but as what the eyes would do if you're here seeing this in person i mean i can't really i'm looking on the camera and it just doesn't look the same when i'm looking at it but it's overwhelming you almost get a sense of humility you know, you just have this towering monument in front of you. And we'll walk to the next sign over here. Um, and so this mound, I believe it's the second largest in the area. Don't quote me on that. I'm still learning for myself here. This is my first day immersing myself, really getting, I've been to Cahokia before, I've been to Serpent Mound before, but I and I've been to some of the interpretive centers, but I never really dug in until now. So. This mound, I believe they discovered over a hundred 
and 22 bodies of women, men, children, and unusual artifacts and objects were discovered within. And these we have to also take into consideration. You just see this mound here. First of all, this is the work of you have astronomers, mathematicians, engineers that this was all well thought out in advance that came together and they had to take soil from you know a distance from one place and move that soil. They would literally work with the animals. They would use um, you know the bones of, of different animals, deer and, and so forth, clamshells as tools. And you that would have to be someone that observed nature animal life for a long period before deciding to use these tools in a way to fashion the soil to create these mounds. Some of the mounds, they would they believe that they carried baskets that would have been weaved that would have weighed up to 35 to 40 pounds. Some mounds, such as Cahokia, would have required millions of baskets of soil. That's what the archaeologists tell us. And in here, this would have been built in three stages, right? So you would have, hey, what's up, Audrey, in the super chat? Rosalie, and so glad you guys can join me for the virtual virtual tour here. Okay, so this bottom layer that I'm going across here, this would have been an oblong, multi-room, uh, essentially they call it a mortuary chamber because they found, like I said, over a hundred and over a hundred bodies, a uh, hundred skeletal remains were found buried inside. So it's considered a mortuary chamber. So yes. In, these were burial mounds. Not all mounds were burial mounds. Some are effigy mounds. This in particular was a burial mound. Then there would be the second layer on top, right? And then you have a final, the final secondary mound, which is attributed to the Hopewell restoration. So I need to look at the academic literature, dig in a bit deeper. I'm not certain how far back it could potentially go. Let's see what the sign says here. Anatomy of a mound. Right, so this is exactly what I was just explaining. You can see what they call a log crypt below. Right, so that would be all of this here. What's up, Mango Slice? Shout out to everyone joining us in the super chat. Um, and then you have the primary mound and the secondary mound. Let's see, anatomy of a mound. C. Pricer Mound, the second largest known Hopewell mound. Right, so the second largest in the Hopewell area evolved through a sequence of events starting with the building of an oblong, multi-room mortuary built nearly 2,000 years ago. Ceremonial leaders cremated bodies elsewhere and interred them here in the mortuary building. They built earthen platforms where ashes were laid and to a lesser extent, they placed extended corpse in log crypts. Some 122 men, women, children were buried here and unusual objects surrounding the remains. And there you can see the mortuary temple and here's some of the artifacts. Here's an image of archeologist Henry Shethron, Shethron, Shethron excavated the mound between 1926 and 1928. So, you know, to really get an understanding of what we're looking at here, it would best be observed from up above, looking down. We have this massive mound in front of us, the second largest for the Hopewell, but really it dwarfs in comparison to what's really going on here. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I'm currently, and this is really fertile ground, um, I'm currently standing in the middle of an irregular circle. This is somewhat near the center of an irregular circle and about a thousand feet that way is another small circle. And then, and you can, you can maybe make that out a little bit in the distance. Emma says the objects that they found in these mounds are beautiful, shame they, so many were destroyed and looted and the artifacts stole, thrown away. Absolutely, so when they first started, um, in response to Emma's comment, you know, when they first started excavating these mounds, this is before a lot of the archaeology, you know, the archaeological practices and standards that are applied today, you know, were put into place, which is interesting because there really isn't even much art. There's still archaeology, but people aren't digging like they used to. Archaeology is more about teaching these days in the classroom than actually digging as technology advances and we're looking for more non-invasive techniques. We don't want to destroy things, we want to preserve things, which is exactly what happened here. Basically a bunch of people got together to try to preserve and conserve this land in the late 1800s. It was early, I believe it was the late 1800s, they came together and recognized the need 
to preserve these mounds. Some began excavating the mounds. There's a whole bunch of interesting finds that come out of the mounds, different artifacts, which also suggest an extensive trade network, which basically spans from, from here outside all the way north to Canada, all the way down to the uh, Gulf of Mexico, across to the Rockies or East Texas, and then back all the way to the East Coast. So essentially everybody across America you know, there, there was trade all the way up and down, north and south, east and west. Yeah, so let me turn this around. And of course, we know from, for example, um, let's see, like uh, Chaco Canyon. Chaco Canyon had trade with Mexico, or it's assumed because of some of the artifacts they found there. Well, okay, look, so, well, here's a trail in the distance. You can barely see it. But there's a circle here. If we were to send the drone up above, we can get some better aerial footage of that. And then about a thousand feet or so this way is a square pattern. Now this square and circle pattern is a common recurring theme here. We see it at several sites. And what's interesting is the squares are always, I believe, 27 acres. And the fact that they keep recurring, that we have these squares with 27 acres, would suggest that the Hopewell had some common unit of measure which is very interesting. I know that a lot of people are familiar with my colleague Chris Dunn's work. I'll be touring with him. We're doing our uh, Lost Technologies and Symbolism tour of Egypt this September. And a lot of people are familiar with Chris Dunn's work on Lost Technologies and his earlier work, Lost Technologies of Egypt, and his earlier work, the Giza Power Plant. But what a lot of people don't know is that even before Chris had Christopher published the Giza Power Plant, he wrote an article on the earthworks of Ohio and uh, wrote extensively about the comparisons that he found, simil striking similarities he found between these earthworks and essentially particle accelerators, modern technology. We'll be getting more into that in this series. I'm gonna be linking up with Chris while I'm on the road here. We're going to connect at Cahokia, so you're going to want to stay tuned. I have a very exciting episode lined up for you guys, but I just wanted to check in with a quick live video to let everyone know that I'm in Ohio and, you know, I've been, we've been doing the Pueblos, Petroglyphs, Pictographs, New England's Mysterious Stone Chambers. Now we're focusing on the mounds of ancient America starting here. What's up, Bales? Send up the drone. The drone's about to go up. And Bales, just to let you know, everything checks out as far as I can see at America Stonehenge. Bales was with me at America Stonehenge, and it does appear to have a um, serpent-like pattern that may be suggestive of the Ouroboros. From above, it does look like it could be the Ouroboros. So everything that we're seeing on the ground checks out in the sky. So here's the mound again. Again, you know, looking through the iPhone here and then taking my eyes away and looking at it in person, it just doesn't do it justice. And so one more time, this would have been in three layers and that would have been three separate stages over time. It may have been that like this lower layer was eventually decommissioned and they had to reestablish, you know, it could have been new leaders, new shaman a new time, it could have been symbolic. It could even be symbolic of the three worlds, the, the underworld, the plane in which we dwell in the higher world. But I don't think that's the case because it was done over such long periods of time. I think it was just a, a ritual, um, essentially, you know, perhaps planting the seed like we see in Egypt where you take an older, Ari Schwalad Lubitsch has written extensively about this, where you take an older piece of, something and use it, you know, whether it's a monument or a mound, but use it as a seed because essentially they were practicing the mysteries of life and death, renewal and regeneration. I often wonder, you know, the mounds could be considered symbolic as the primordial mound. Um, I often wonder if it could also be symbolic of a, a coil serpent. The serpent is always you know, the, the life giver, the giver of life in many different cultures. I mean, the serpent has so many different symbolic attributions, but, you know, perhaps even a turtle. We always have Turtle Island, but, you know, it could potentially be the representation of the serpent coiled up. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. This is purely speculative. 
It's all conjecture. Let me know what you think. What do you think the mounds may be representing symbolically? As an esotericist, I'm really interested in this because I want to know, you know, yes, we have the mound. Again, the mound dwarfs in comparison to two acres of earthworks that you cannot see very well from this from this vantage point. I'm gonna to have to send the drone up and look down to really get a sense of the, the geometric shapes. And we may not even see much because much of it has been destroyed by plowing and farming. Here, not so much the case because they're preserving it, but all throughout uh, Ohio, you know, or several states in the US, we've lost a lot of these mounds and artifacts. It truly is unfortunate. And so, you know, as an esotericist, I wonder about the function, the spiritual function. This is sometimes um, difficult for academia to accept, you know, in terms of, did it, it can't, you know, it could purely be, it could purely be aesthetically, you know, it's, it's for aesthetics, but I don't think that's the case. The fact that it has a specific shape, the fact that we have, it's always 27 acres of, of, of square, the square circle pattern. We see the circle, the circular shapes, even, you know, in the Southwest with the Kivas, I feel like there's something more and there may be something that we're missing. Now, Chris Dunn's article comparing them to, you know, more modern um, scientific work, which again, we'll get to in a future video. Um, it's very interesting for me. Of course, the article is very suggestive. It's not really definitive, but as, as you'll see when we cover it in the video, but it's very interesting to consider because I do think there's something more that we're just not seeing. As an esotericist, it's, it's my job to try to look at the inner aspect of things and try to understand the, you know, the purpose behind everything. Uh, Steiner, Rudolf Steiner, you know, has spoke about the spirit of a nation. I would say that the Hopewell certainly, in order to in order to even just these mound building cultures to take all the soil like that to work with mineral, you know, you have the mineral kingdom, the plant kingdom, the animal, animal kingdom, and so on, just to, to work with the soil, which is still very much alive, still has that, you know, spiritual essence to it. And to apply it in such a way, I feel like there may be some sort of technology that we're just not understanding. I'm not saying it's um, a hard technology, but more of a soft or spiritual technology something that we just can't grasp with our modern Western ontology, you know? So why, why the concentric shapes? Why the geometric shapes? There may be something more to this. And so I'm really interested in digging in and learning more. Let me know what you think. I'm just getting started. Again, I'm no expert on the mounds. This is really new to me. I'm just digging in now. So again, let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you think they hold a symbolic significance? Do you think there's something more? Did they serve a function or a purpose? This is NEXT, Adept Expeditions, Ancient America, signing out. Take care, everybody.